Now, Finn has a very interesting story. I, I'm glad you've come here to uh, join the discussion about the airline. Uh, it's a company based right on the northern periphery of Europe. It's a long-standing airline going back with very early aviation heritage. Many people may not know a lot about it, but that position in the north of Europe could be a disadvantage if an airline was not sharp in seeing what its opportunities were. And Finnair has certainly taken that opportunity in developing traffic from Europe to Asia. And it's got some very state-of-the-art aircraft, which is facilitating its ability to do that. So let's waste no more time and, and learn more about that uh, with Pekka. So Pekka, welcome to the World Travel Market. Okay. I think it's your first time here, isn't it? Yeah, for me, first time. Too. Okay. Thanks. And Pekka uh, joined the airline, I think, is it three years ago now? Yeah, three and a half. But you came from a very different background. If I'm not mistaken, you worked in the, the mining industry mm. uh, and cargo. So what was it that took you over into this rather precarious world of the airline business? Well, you know, headhunters move people, so okay. that's a short right. answer. Right. <laughs> when um, you were approached... Of course, I mean, um, um, airline, like any other business, at the end of the day, they are people businesses. Uh, big, big time and that's that's the thing that combines many many things and airlines big time are people businesses and I think that's what's exciting in it. And what was that true in the sectors you worked in before? I mean mining I know nothing about. I mean obviously there yeah. are people on the, the, the front line doing the mining but is it? Uh, I've, I've been doing that one as well a long long time ago. Yes. I worked underground for about four, four years of my life early okay. on early on but I was a long long time with the with the Swedish group Sandvik um, Sandvik and uh, I was doing all kinds of uh, things within, within that from, from uh, uh, product development, R&D, all the way to frontline sales, uh, all around the world, basically. Okay. I traveled extensively, especially the Southern Hemisphere. <laughs> so you lived out in Asia, which yes. I, I guess uh, is, is pretty relevant. I'm sure we'll yeah, draw upon that. Eight, eight years uh, in two occasions, in, uh, lived in Hong Kong, but worked in China, and um, then a couple of years in North America, in, in Canada. Okay, and now, now back home in Finland and running the, the country's uh, national airline. Yes. Well, when those headhunters approached you and sounded you out and you started to do your homework on thin air, I mean, obviously you took the job. You were mm. offered a job and you took the job. But what was your impression of the airline? Because it, it, although, as I said, it's got heritage which goes back a long way, it had had a lot of challenging times in recent years, like, as with many airlines facing change and uh, staff problems. Yeah. Of course, um, uh, we Finns, we... we we all have an opinion on Finnair. Uh, Finnair, unlike the, the others, I mean, Finnair is not that well known, known globally or, or even, even Europe-wide, but every Finn knows, knows Finnair. And, and of course, I knew of the, of the challenges and, and the history. On the other hand, it's a very, very strong brand in Finland. And uh, I had sort of very warm thoughts to, to start with. But then, of course, uh, uh, considering the uh, couple of aspects, things like, for example, we are a government-owned company, or well, government-majority-owned company. We are a listed company, company, and knowing the challenges, I was kind of wondering whether, whether we can do things that need to be done, or whether there is so and so much uh, political guidance or, or guidance coming from, from, from that side, and how much of it there's, there's anyway some of it. Uh, that was one question that I had in my mind. And then the second one was that do I really want to deal with the publicity that comes along, especially, especially in the home country. So, so you were able to be more low profile in your previous job, and now you're going to move into a job where you had to be there yeah, in, 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 the, in the spotlight, true. so to speak. True. I was this morning on BBC, and, uh, and uh, I was talking to a friend of mine in the morning, morning and, uh, and uh, I kind of uh, told him where, where I was going, and and uh, then I, I had to say that, like five years ago, I couldn't think of being interviewed on BBC, but anyways, there I was. <laughs> well, that should be on the BBC iPlayer, so if you want to see more <laughs> about Pekka, you'll better see him on the, the programme he did uh, this morning here in London. And as you said, you, you wondered whether you would really have the freedom, because I, I guess it was with a commercial companies, privately owned companies mm. you were working in before with mining yes. and, uh, uh, and cargo, so you were used to having freedoms there, uh, freedoms of commercial action. Mm. Uh, did you have a, a discussion with the, the government as a, as a key shareholder about, look, the things I think I'll need to do here, uh, am I going to be able to uh, have that freedom as uh, part of your decision not making? Not so much directly with the government, but of course, a um, lot of discussion with the board and, and board members, especially chairman, chairman to, to understand the picture that how, what the dynamics is there. And, uh, is there and, uh, and I have to say afterwards that, that yes, there's been some communication, some debate, some attempts to guide, but uh, in, in the governance, I mean, we are a public company and, and we need to respect not only one shareholder, but, but all the other shareholders as well and look after their, 
their interests and equally. Other private shareholders as well, or are they all different uh, public entities as owners of the airline? Um, there are there are private uh, private shareholders as well. It's owned by the government, and, and then there are some uh, maybe two mutual pension funds are the two next biggest ones, and then it comes to, to private individuals more or less that own all the rest. Okay. Now I mentioned that uh, you know the airline had been through troubled times, and if we look at maybe. Some of your neighboring airlines, quite close, like SAS, which has been on a long journey or even struggle to try to get itself in, in good financial shape uh, and has had strikes even recently. Finnair, it seems to me from a distance, had some similar problems. You needed to get in shape. The world had changed. Unions were quick to strike. But in trying to find out more about you in, in my background mm -hmm. to prepare for the interview, I asked people about you know, this dynamic and people said, well, OPECA has done a lot in terms of bringing the unions on board. Is that something that has been a, of high importance in, your, in the last three years to have a dialogue with the, you know, the, the labor groups, uh, maybe particularly those who have the most power, like pilots, for example? Uh, it's, it's been a big, big part of it. Of course, um, mm, when I joined, we were in the middle of, of cost cutting program and, and that was a necessity. Uh, we needed to go through that one, but of course, I saw that one coming to an end uh, at, at, at one point in, in time. And of course, I started to think about that. What is the way going forward for us? And, and um, uh, it's, it's a very basic fact that airline, it's, it's service business. And it's, uh, it's, um, they, they, they are passengers, customers, individuals that, that travel with us. Half of our personnel, uh, when they are at work, they meet every day with customers, which is quite different from my past. I mean, being an industrial, uh, working for an industrial business, uh, business, I mean, you have a few salespeople, some service people that meet with customers, but most of the people are working in sort of uh, uh, other, other tasks. But, but in an airline service business, so there needs to be a connection between how the relationships are within a company and what the culture is within a company and what kind of service the company provides. As you say, I mean, it, it is all about people. So I guess if you don't have that trust and belief behind the scenes with you and, and your board and management and frontline staff, then you have nothing. That service is not going to be delivered uh, to the standard that is required. Um, so how did you go about that engagement? Because if we look, if we look in the airline world now, I mean, we had Willie Walsh uh, talking, uh, your good colleague from One World yesterday. He's made enormous changes in airlines he's worked for. There's been some very tough times, but in talking with him yesterday, he contrasted, for example, with Air France, another airline which is still struggling. You know, they seem to be ridden with strikes the whole time, uh, particularly with pilots. How did you approach that dynamic uh, to convince people that change was needed, but that it would ultimately be beneficial to them as well as to customers? Of course, um, <clears throat> a lot of that convincing and, and establishing the need to change, that was done, done before my time. My time, and of course, my my sort of a contribution was that okay, how do we really uh, drive it uh, to the to the results, and how do we achieve those those objectives that we that we had set ourselves? And and um, uh, I wanted, I, I took a little bit of time off in in that one. It was uh, some extent uh, to some extent controversial because everything was geared up that we will we will take a tough fight. Uh, we probably took eight to ten months additional time, which in my opinion, it's not a long, long time. And if I compare what the, what the let's say, alternative course of action would have meant, I don't see any payback for, for tough action because we achieved anyways those results that we needed to achieve. Jointly, agreeing, uh, tough issues, but we achieved what we needed to achieve. And I guess it's an ongoing process. You don't just do it once. You've got to keep people on side and new challenges come along, which we'll, exactly. we'll, we'll talk about. And just one other more, more general question. Coming into this industry, uh, what were your thoughts about the way it was structured and the way it went about its business, not only in Finnair, but globally, compared to, say, what you knew in, yeah. for example, the mining sector? Did yeah. it seem strange or were there parallels? Um, some parallels, some, some things that were really... Uh, really like, um, I would say that, uh, for example, I mean, let's, let's con continue to talk about the unions and, and the way how companies interact in this business with, with unions. I think it's a very, very traditional way of, of dealing, dealing with, with unions. And at the end of the day, you deal with your own personnel. And uh, that's, that's where the difference was probably the biggest compared to, to where I, where I came, came from. Um, and uh, that is also something that I, I thought that, hey, 
maybe we could we could try in a small airline like Finnair try a different approach and I think we are on our way and uh, we were seeing some results. Okay, good to hear. Well, also I, I mentioned you know, the geography of, of Finnair could be nothing but a disadvantage except for the local market uh, if there wasn't a clear strategy just being on that northern periphery of Europe. But uh, obviously preceding your time, the, there was already a, a presence into Asia um, with Helsinki being in many respects on the way to Asia from other European cities, but it's, it's really accelerated recently. So can you tell us a bit more about the, what I call the Asian strategy? You know, what, what is that strategy uh, and what have you been doing in terms of uh, moving into Asian markets? Um, yeah, of course, Asia does have uh, like several sub-markets. Sub -markets. We, all, we all know, know that China is very different from, from Japan and, and then Southeast Asia. Asia once again it's uh, it's it's a different and and so it is for for us as well and and it's not one place and uh, and therefore when we look at for example the cycles and uh, uh, economic cycles um, uh, yes the the world economy might might sort of uh, go in in certain type of waves but since there are several sub markets there are always places which are are doing better than the others others in Asia and it's 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 not like having all the eggs in one, one basket in, in, in our view. Our view, there's, there's, there's a good, great mix of, of, of different things. Um, we did not grow for many, many years, uh, years, and that was one of the observations that I, that I made uh, when I came in, that uh, uh, we, on the other hand, we had the cost-cutting programs, but, but then we know that the seniority increases the cost levels, in, especially in airlines, um, um, automatically. Um, but if there's no growth, so how do you manage the profitability? I mean, it's, 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 if you don't grow the top line, top line uh, you ev regardless of the cost cuttings that you do, you have the, the increasing cost level underneath. So, so that was the thing that, that we needed to get into as fast as possible. We, we, we kind of, it's afterwards always so easy to say, mm -hmm. <laughs> easy to say, but, um, uh, but we probably should have put a bit more emphasis on, on growth and top line. Early, earlier already. But to grow, you've got to have, you know, it's one thing to grow and it's another, as you said, to be able to do that profitably. Uh, and, and Asia is where you are, are growing. And, uh, tell us more about that because you said it's not, it's not one kind of homogenous market. Um, tell us about the differences there. Let, let, let's say, for example, start with China because I, I mm -hmm. think you, I may be wrong, but I think you, do you serve more Chinese cities than directly? Uh, than any other European airline, or is it similar to, uh, say, sim Air, sim similar similar to, to, say yeah. Air France, KLM, I think that's the other yeah. strongest group. Yeah, we, we, we fly, uh, next summer, for example, we have 35 weekly flights to China, we have 35 weekly flights to, to Japan as well next, next summer, so that, that's 70 flights, and then we fly another 30 flights to, to other destinations in uh, in, in Asia altogether. All uh, China, of course, uh, as a market, um, China is slowing down, and, and that's the sort of a macro picture of, of China. But still within China, the growth is not equal. And, and the middle class who's traveling and, and who's, who's really going out of China now is, uh, is, is growing at the incredible rate, even though China is, is slowing, slowing down. So I think that gives the, gives the basis, uh, basis for... for and, uh, uh, justifies the existence in, in China and expansion in, in, in China. Uh, we have been uh, developing uh, um, uh, also the second tier cities, not, not only flying from the Shanghai's and Beijing's. Uh, Beijing's there, of course, I mean, it takes a long, long, long time for these destinations and routes to, to mature to, to a point, and, and therefore the, uh, the growth needs to go kind of hand, hand in hand developing the mature destinations and, and second tier. Yeah, I, I wanted to ask you about that. I mean, I, I've just been to China about a month ago myself with, with an airline industry uh, event, the Roots Conference, and traveled to Chengdu, which is a, a city I didn't really know anything about until I went to this conference, which was held there. Now, I know it's a city that you don't serve, but that route is a route which British Airways introduced only about three or four years ago. And they just announced about two weeks back they're going to come out of that route. It hasn't, it hasn't worked. So... Tell us, you know, why isn't that big difference? But, you know, these cities are massive, you know, there are millions of population. Mm -hmm. You say that routes like Beijing, Shanghai, Hong Kong, they work well. Why are these secondary cities, which have also got millions of people, why, why are they so much harder? Why would BA come out of Chengdu? Uh, and why, why is it harder work for you 
uh, on these kind of cities to make them yeah. come to maturity. Yeah, uh, living standard in, in these second tier cities, it's, it's somewhat, somewhat below, in, in some of these quite a ways below Shanghai's and, and Beijing, so the people really don't have so much funds, even though the, the, on, the, on the macro, the, the population of a city might be 10 million or, or more than 10 million, and the entire province around it might be 30, 40, 40 million. So it does have the future population base, but, but maybe not not uh, today's population base. And, and then, then of course, um, um, the offering uh, in these local markets like, like Chengdu, there's a lot of flights, intra-Asia flights, for example, and, uh, and um, first uh, overseas, overseas or international travels for, for Chinese are very often within, within Asia, and they go to Thailand and, and these places, maybe one, two, three, four, five trips before they start to look for, for longer distance uh, travels. Then I think for, for us the specialty is that, that when we open this kind of second tier city, we can then connect from Helsinki naturally to, to, to about 70 destinations in Europe. And that gives a lot of variety for the, for the local market. If we compare with some, some others that have a, a big destination, like for example London here, mm -hmm. uh, London here, which as a such is a very attractive uh, travel destination, but that is only one place in a way that it, that it offers and, and it's not maybe the, the most common place to transfer uh, to other places in, in Europe. So we offer this possibility to transfer in Helsinki. And I think it's important to, to uh, uh, expand on that because uh, I've seen one of your own presentations. Uh, not everybody in the audience may realize about the, the geographic importance of Helsinki from other European cities. Uh, I think you've got a presentation that shows like a, a flat world map mm. uh, and it would look, uh, if you went from uh, west to east, from somewhere in Europe to somewhere in China, it would look like you're going out of your way to go via Helsinki. But in fact, the reality, because of uh, simply the spherical nature of the world, is, is it's the opposite. It's yeah. You, yeah, if you fly advantage. anywhere from central, central northern or Western or even Southern, Southern Europe uh, towards Northeast Asia, you are within two to four hours right above Helsinki. So it only shows that this is the, the shortest way and, and more or less straight line from, from Europe to, to Asia. And it's not a diversion, not at all. It's, it's on a natural way. And, and uh, we've made some calculations, some, some simple basic calculations. For example, let's take uh, fuel consumption. And if, if you fly, with a, with a white body aircraft from Asia to Helsinki and then continue with a narrow body somewhere in Europe, your f fuel burn per passenger becomes less if you have a stop in Helsinki. It's quite amazing when you look at that one. And it's not only fuel burn, it's also emissions and things, things like that. So I think it's a sustainable what we, what we do also from that perspective. And uh, not only does it uh, you know, tick the box, if you like, from an envi environmental point of view, the experience, you've made it a very positive experience. The journey, of course, is shorter, but uh, I was reading your, your connecting time in Helsinki, if you compare it to uh, you know, a congested hub like Heathrow, is incredibly short. You know, is it 40, 45 minutes, 40 yeah, minutes? I think it's 30, 35 minutes is the, is the minimum connecting time. So it is uh, our terminal, everything is under one roof. Uh, one roof and um, um, uh, connectivity is there. We, our, our bank structure is such that, I mean, when uh, all our planes more or less in the afternoon, they are in Helsinki and they just swap passengers and, and they go away, uh, go, go away to their destinations again. And uh, uh, within two hours, Helsinki in the afternoon, it's as busy as Heathrow is, is the rest of the time. Let's not talk about it. <laughs> so you don't have the, uh, the need for extra room to expand. <laughs> you don't have an even extra runway as yet. So uh, just just we, two we hours a day. We have three of them. Yes. Okay. <laughs> plenty of capacity. Yeah. So, but I mean, having that short connecting time is great, but it, it has to work. But, and, and again, you, ha you you have a big focus from what what I've seen on the reliability of those connections and punctuality. I think that is that is crucial because this the cost of irregularity in 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 or rerouting passengers or suffering from delays and, and, and that kind of things can be excessive so therefore therefore one one really cornerstone is that how do you operate airline with the high punctuality and high reliability uh, and it's 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 part of us uh, what we what we do we'll come back to a couple of those points in a minute i don't want to lose the the, the, um, the thoughts about asia because as you said it's not homogenous you explained i think very interestingly about the difference and the reasons why secondary Chinese cities um, are much harder to make work mm. than the big ones. But what about uh, Japan? I mean, I, I, I know in my own time in the airline industry, I can remember years when 
airlines couldn't get enough seats to Japan, certainly mm -hmm. out of the UK. I worked for carriers who were always looking within the, the bilateral agreements to get more and more frequency mm -hmm. into Tokyo. But today they, they have less frequency than they did 20 years ago because mm -hmm. of the stagnation in the Japanese economy. But you're flying not only to Tokyo, but to other Japanese cities. So tell us about Japan and how that is different to China. How are you making that work to multiple cities in a time when the, the country still has a stagnation of activity? Yeah, um, uh, the Japanese market that, that we serve, I mean, we fly to Tokyo, Nagoya, Osaka, and, and now summertime we flew to, to Fukuoka as well. Uh, Fukuoka, we opened just uh, this, this past summer now, and we were maybe lucky because some others uh, who flew from there to, to Europe, they decided to discontinue it on, a, on more or less on a day we announced that we're going to open it. So, so there was a good opening and good luck. Uh, good luck with, with that one. We were so happy to expand in the, to, the, to the southern island of, of Japan. But uh, the Japanese uh, market, uh, there, there are different segments like in, in all markets, but we, we all seen um, uh, retired Japanese uh, people traveling to Europe in, in groups, in smaller groups or in, in pairs. And, and that is a very, very important uh, uh, segment and has been an important segment for us uh, always. They tend to travel very often also in business class class so they are sort of a high paying paying passengers and and they are fairly wealthy wealthy passengers as well all all together then of course uh, you need to uh, um, make your product such that that you can cater also these uh, older elderly people that that are traveling with you and i th i think over over time we learned learn to serve them serve them in a, in a way that they feel comfortable to to travel with us then there's there's young women that like to go on on it's uh, it's it's all, almost like uh, bef before women in japan we, before they get married they like to make a trip somewhere and that's that's an other very ac very interesting uh, segment that we we see and they tend to come in 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 either two together three or four four together in sm really small groups groups and they'll, they'll just want to come to europe and uh, spend some time in two or three different cities and then take lots of photos and, and then go back home. home and it's Get uh, married and never travel again. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> uh, well, at least when they retire, they tend to travel again. <laughs> Maybe they are too busy in between. In between but, but to understand that, that market dynamics, it's, a, it's a different from China, where the, where the growing middle class, they just want to go out there. And a um, big part of it is to see those, those, those things that they have seen pictures and, and read about, plus do shopping. That's a, that's a big thing for, for, for Chinese, not, not so much for, for Japanese. So, so that's, that's quite interesting, those segments there in the, in the Japanese market. Uh, I've seen it in the Chinese market, uh, you know, even some charter flights that have been operated, done with a travel agent into some unusual airports, like I think Liège Airport in Belgium. And I've read that they uh, even, tra that airport is mainly a cargo airport, but they've transformed the look of the airport, putting Chinese signs up, putting, Chinese food available, and then uh, the tour operators use this as an entry point to Europe, and they've gone on a bus, I think, to as many different European capitals as they can in a short space of time, and gone back. Have you had to do those kind of things uh, to, to make the, the new uh, segments of travelers feel comfortable, both in language and cultural terms, to, to, mm. to use Finnair and to go beyond Helsinki? Yeah, yes, uh, yes, we have. I mean, we have signage in Helsinki. Helsinki in Chinese and Japanese to, to make sure that people can also the, uh, take the advantage of, of short connecting time. I mean, it, it doesn't help if we have short connection, but people cannot find find the gate. gate to gate. To gate. <laughs> so uh, so the, that's that's been done. Um, um, uh, many of our customers are, are uh, Chinese uh, uh, tour operators, and, and they of course uh, do that kind of packaging and and uh, look the the programs. Uh, for, for Chinese and, and Asians. We, for example, um, just um, uh, uh, two weeks ago, uh, Alibaba's uh, uh, online travel, travel business called Alitrip uh, launched their, their European uh, uh, destinations and, and strategy that happened in Lapland, in Rovaniemi, where the Santa Claus comes from. Uh, and um, it was quite a show that they did put up, put up there. The, uh, Alitrip brings this year only 3,000 Chinese to, to, to Lapland, Finnish Lapland. Uh, they have great plans for future to, to increase that one. Um, but it really shows how, how powerful that kind of organizations can be. And uh, 
uh, Alitrip had, had at the same time, by the way, two year anniversary. And it's already selling 15 billion dollars worth of, worth of travel services in two years, quite a, quite a growth. So impressive organization, an impressive show that they, that they did put up there as well. That's amazing. So, so there is something about, I, I've heard about you know, Japanese uh, shopping, as you mentioned, I've, I've known for a long time, was uh, of interest. Uh, but I do quite a lot of work um, in Iceland. I know a lot of Japanese like to go to Iceland because of the landscape. Uh, and when you're talking about you know, what is known in, in Finnish Lapland and Santa trips, uh, this, is, from what you're saying, is a very important part of the market as well for both Chinese and Japanese, that it's a different experience to what they would have at home. Yeah, that's, that's right. Of course, many people nowadays, uh, nowadays, they want to go to Lapland, they want to see the Northern Lights, the Aurora Borealis. Uh, that, that seems to be the, the, the big thing over, over there, and that's what this Ali trip and Ali, Ali, Alibaba was, was, was as well. Um, but the shopping, I think it's quite remarkable. There's been some studies made in, in Finland how much, how much the different tourists uh, or, or people from different countries, how much they spend per day. And uh, currently, Chinese are leading it by far. They like in, in Finland, they, they average, they spend 500, more than 500 euros a day now. And, uh, in Finland? In Finland, wow. that's right. And I, and I think the average spend is, is on international tourists somewhere between 200 and 300 euros a day. So it's, it's a clearly more than, more than and, and this is of course everyone who's, in, who's, who's uh, who's in a business should really study into mm -hmm. that, that what are the needs and specifics uh, that uh, attract them. So it sounds like we've always a really fascinating background, but your, your part of the strategy is not only serving these Asian destinations and these are the two biggest markets, but your, your plan is to double capacity to Asia by 2018. Uh, uh, I guess you, given what you've said, you're confident that it's justified to do this and and add both capacity and, and destinations in what less than two years from now. Yeah, we decided um, earlier this year uh, when we reviewed our strategy that we were already in growth uh, that started with the delivery of Airbus A350 about about a year ago. Uh, we had a growth strategy, but we said that we we need to accelerate, and now we talk about accelerated growth, growth, and um, and of course most of that growth will will be on our Asian flights. So you have this Asian strategy, it's, it's going well, uh, but you also have selective operations elsewhere, Lo long haul. I think it's uh, the US, uh, two or three cities, and uh, did I see you announcing another one for yes. next year? Is it San Francisco? Yes, we fly currently to New York, Miami, Chicago, and then we're opening San Francisco next, uh, next summer. But you do that in a more modest way than, let's say, we you know, Willie Walsh yesterday talking about it. It's massive for IAG because different priorities and different sense in terms of geography, I guess. That's right. You. I mean, for, for us, um, I mean, Europe to Asia, that's the transfer model that we have. That works for us and that provides the growth uh, for, the, for the Asian uh, uh, business. But um, US is, is much more a point to point for, for us. And then, of course, Finland is a very small market, uh, just over five and a half million people. Uh, people there and, uh, and even though US is, is a very attractive travel destination and and of course, many Americans are, are, are traveling, traveling to, towards Finland as well, but it has limits in its, its growth for, for us. Now, you mentioned you know, access to the whole of Europe or European travelers via Helsinki to, to Asia. Uh, you've got to feed these long haul, these hungry wide bodied jets with a, a significant short haul network. Now, the, the challenge that many airlines have had, and uh, I'm sure you have to face is short haul flights don't necessarily make money in their own right, especially as you face more competition. So how have you tackled that? Because I think Finnair has been through a lot of change in, 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 in wrestling with this as an issue in recent years. Yeah, that is, that is true. If we look at, look at our, our wide body operation, it's, it's an efficient operation. Helsinki happens to be on, at an optimum distance from many of Northeastern Asian, Asian cities. And this means that we can turn around the aircraft within 20, 24 hours, hours and fly the same day with the same schedule and we can continue to do that a year round. And at, at best we get to, to utilizations uh, on, for example, on our Bangkok route. If we continue to fly and push, push that one to the max, we'll, we are flying more than 18 hours per day per aircraft. aircraft. And, and in, in sort of average terms in, in those ones where this 24 hour rotation is, is in place, be flying currently more than 17 hours per day. Per day, so it's an efficient operation that one. But then, since we are running a certain bank structure and uh, and we have the, the busy afternoon over there, 
we need to some somewhere compromise a little bit in our network and and that is then with the with the feeder traffic we have to wait uh, at, at some airports for an hour for two hours to make sure that the, the schedules with our bank they, they they work in the optimum optimal way for the for the passengers and and then of course that shows in the, in the cost side and, and how, how do you tackle that? Because you know, we, we see, again, a, a group like Air France, KLM, still struggling with big short-haul losses. Uh, Lufthansa 2, they both set up kind of low-cost airlines in their own group. Uh, IAG has been very ruthless on cost. You have uh, a modest amount of not direct, but low-cost competition from, say, Ryanair into Finland, but certainly with Norwegian. Uh, so in the point-to-point -point market, which ideally you would need to boost up your revenues short-haul, you are facing tough competition. So how do you minimize the losses of a short haul flight so, or, or even try to deliver a, a little bit of profit as well as feeding a long yeah. haul? Of course, um, uh, our cost cutting program was, was aiming very okay. much to, to, uh, to, to, uh, to sort of ease that situation for us. We still have work, work to do in, in that area. Uh, for example, our today's fleet, when you look at, look at that one, it's, uh, it's for, us, for an airline of, of our size, it's, it's probably too fragmented, too many too many aircraft types and we have to get into more into standardization of, of our fleet and, and that's what we're working towards and, and we see that that reduces the complexity and, and will also reduce our costs. For a time uh, uh, you try to do a, a kind of a venture with Flybe, the a British uh, a regional carrier to lower your cost to short haul but that came to an end uh, last year I think and you bought the venture back I think for nominal mm. I don't know euro or something what what happened there because that looked to be an interesting approach to try to keep the necessary short haul feed but reduce the cost was it um, yeah of course um, uh, at the end of the day we did not see the cost reduction that we that we that we wanted to see in 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 that one and that was the that was the reason why it then came to an end Okay. And what about uh, uh, the rise of long haul low cost? Uh, Norwegian is getting bigger on that. They're taking many more 787 aircraft. Bjorn Kios, uh, who I'm sure you know well, talks about these Asian markets as being in his sights for the future. At the moment, he's very North Atlantic focused, apart from, I think, Thailand. Would you see that as a threat, or do you think that was something they can develop their own business and you can continue to develop yours in mm -hmm. the future? Uh, of course, it is, it is always always a threat, but on the other hand, it is fact that, that um, competition is out, out there and it's it's free free world to compete. Um, he has focused on, on Atlantic traffic, uh, as we all know, all, all know, and, uh, and that's probably so, source of, of, of concerns for many other airlines that, that have big exposure on Atlantic flights flights right now. We have, we have an exposure there, but it's more of a point-to-point -point traffic, and it's quite a small part of our operation. Maybe some 10% 10, 10 or so is on North Atlantic. The rest is either Asia or Europe. But wh when uh, you know, somebody like Bjorn Kios says, I want to go to Asia much more, and we ha have, he talks about the, the rising Chinese middle classes that you mentioned, um, I personally wonder, do they face more of a challenge because of some of the things you described, that not all of these cities are equal in their wealth, even though they, are, they have mm. big populations, uh, and because some of the markets point to point may be quite small, unless they're feeding substantially, which is what you can do, uh, are they not going to face a challenge which actually could be to your advantage? Yeah. Well, it's, it's been fairly slow, their mm. expansion to, to China. Yeah. China, I think they, they fly to, to Bangkok, uh, uh, that might be the, the only one. Only that Asian I, I, destination. Yeah, that, that might be the only one that I could, I could recall. So it's been a slow progress in, in that, and they have had to obviously full focus on, on Atlantic flights, flights recently. I'm sure we will see them, see them on Asian routes in future as well. Now, you touched earlier on the, 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 the aircraft that you uh, took delivery of, I think, just over a year ago, uh, and the first in Europe, the Airbus A350, as your vehicle of growth in these long-haul markets. Is that proving to, is it living up to expectations as a very state-of-the-art aircraft, both in terms of customer experience, but also in terms of economics for you as a, as a business? It has worked, worked for us. Of course, new, new aircraft always has, has its, um, its issues, but uh, there really hasn't been anything major, as I'm, I'm sure we all, all would have known of those mm -hmm. if, if there had been. Uh, had been, but nothing uh, as uh, problematic as a Boeing had with 787. Yeah, I don't know all the details of that one, but uh, but I do not hear. Uh, we don't have such issues on on ours, and 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 I do not hear all the others having having as severe issues uh, as as with with that one. Um, uh, but of course, uh, new aircraft and transitioning fleet transitioning 
it's a major training exercise for, for, for people, for pilots. Um, uh, training where we are clearly struggling at this moment to, to get enough pilots, uh, pilots trained. Um, it's an issue, uh, same, same with all the personal availability of spare parts because there's no consumption history and things like that. That uh, they, are, they are kind of uh, issues that need to be worked through and I think we are, we are well on our way. Uh, to, to tackle these and, and we'll get the, the, the reliability on, on sort of a level where we used to be with our, our older fleets. We are not much behind. Now we've heard, uh, I mean, uh, Akbar Abakar, who uh, a colleague of yours again through One World, and I think do you participate in a joint venture partly with uh, him? Not, not with uh, Okay. Uh, well, uh, he's we go uh, chair. Yes. Okay. I mean, certainly they're very involved with IAG and he's not shy when he has problems with aircraft. He's been very vocal about you know, the, the challenge Airbus has given him with delays mm -hmm. in A350 deliveries and, and other short-haul aircraft, the, the uh, 320, 320 NEO. Has, has that problem hit you? Have you received less aircraft than you were due to receive now, along with the other problems you described the, about pilot training and so on? Yeah. We, we are right on the, on the schedule if we look at on sort of um, the, the planned annual deliveries, but the individual aircrafts, there's been delays, like delays of one to three months, uh, three months uh, on the, let's say, confirmed uh, deliveries. And, and that is, I would say that uh, that causes more like operational uh, difficulties for us uh, uh, with, the, with the crew rostering, with the training, uh, scheduling of training. There's, there's shortage of simulator capacity for A350 at this moment, we're getting ours. Uh, within a few months, and, and that will the situation will, will will be better then for us. But but right now the simulators are in Miami and in Toulouse, and are they in, is there one in Taipei or something like that? And and uh, we need to book those ahead, and and we need to stick to those those schedules. And and uh, if we don't have an aircraft, it's it's a problem. <laughs> you cannot do simulator training one year ahead. You need to do it within a At certain time when the aircraft is going to be there. Yeah, yeah. What about the, uh, just looking now at some of the more um, broad industry issues? I mean, I, I remember seeing you quoted not long after you uh, became CEO of Finnair, uh, saying that not every country today can justify having its own national airline, and you expressed openness for Finnair, while it will continue to you know, remain as a, a proud you know, representative of Finland, it's not likely to remain independent, but you would see it joining a group in the future. Can you just tell us? Uh, your reasoning for saying that in the case of Finnair and, and how you see uh, consolidation going in the industry currently? Mm. Yeah, for sure. If, if, we, if we look at the long-term trend, we take like 30 years back, every country more or less in, in Europe had its own, own airline. Today, we look at Southern Europe, we look at Central Europe es especially, uh, and we look at the formation of three big groups and emergence of, of low-cost airlines. Uh, airlines and, um, and then there's, there are a few airlines like uh, uh, of, of size like, like Finnair. I think what's unique on, on Finnair is the, the, the Asian business that we have. There we are, we are much, much bigger than, than what Finland needs or, or uh, we, we've taken relatively huge share of, of that Asian business and um, that have sort of provided us the, 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 the road ahead, the road ahead so far. But then when we look at, look at these, these big groups, on the other hand, the competition from, from the low cost, low cost um, and then the scale benefits that, uh, uh, that a, a bigger group uh, would potentially bring, not necessarily, but, but potentially bring. Um, I'm sure there are, there are some, things, uh, some things that could be beneficial for Finnair as well. So you could, uh, you, would you actively be looking to become part of a group? I mean, to me, uh, you may not want to answer, it would seem IAG would be maybe a, a logical home. If we, we look at how they've developed, they've kept individual brands, they've got different kinds of airlines with, as you say, different, uh, if you like, USPs that they bring to the party. Uh, is that something you could imagine for the future? Yeah. Um, um, we, we, of course, I mean, when we look at, I mean, we need to consider the ownership. I mean, the government owns 50, 56 percent of, of the company, and and there is a certain interest with the government to make sure that that Finland, in all conditions, does have the connectivity. If we look at the map, I mean, we are more or less like on an island, island there, and it's it's important mm -hmm. to have the flight uh, flight flight connections. So, so therefore, any any combination that one could think of, it needs to be such where Finland would have a, a natural natural role. 
and where, where we could continue to, to grow and develop the, the, the business and the model that, that we, have, we have done. Well, I guess it's, I, I can't uh, sort of uh, interrogate you too much on that point, but it's, it's an interesting one because obviously we've seen a, the Irish government maybe had similar concerns of Aer Lingus and the last year has been a big change. So uh, hopefully if things develop, we'll get you back in the future, Pekka, and ask you more, but uh, it's an interesting element <laughs> on that. But even if you, if you don't get to that level of consolidation, I mean, obviously you do have partnerships. You're in the One World Alliance, which is, is the one that uh, IAG is a uh, prime mover in. And you're also involved in a couple of the, um, I think, IAG or partly IAG business, joint business ventures across the Atlantic and particularly to Japan. Uh, are those helpful to you in uh, making your business work? Yeah, we have altogether about 20, 25% of our, our business is in these joint businesses. Small part of it, it's in it's in Atlantic, where we are together with the, with the British Airways, uh, Iberian American Airlines, and and uh, and then um, major part of, of that is uh, is in in Siberian with our Japan flights, where we are together with uh, with uh, British Airways, Japan Airlines, and now recently Iberia joining joining that one. Uh, um, I think they they've been good combinations for for us. We've been. Uh, in these one three or four years now, now all to all together, and we've been able to grow our businesses, both Atlantic business and and uh, uh, the, the business in in Japan. So it has worked worked for us. Okay, and just touching back uh, uh, on the the airport, you talked about the importance of the uh, the connections. I was asking the the the, uh, the two gentlemen yesterday. Uh, from Emirates and IG, Tim Clark and Willie Walsh about airport relationships and that really got them going mm. because of course we're having this discussion here in the UK mm. about we may be having a new runway at Heathrow perhaps in 10 or 11 years time but you know Willie Walsh has gone out very vocally about uh, the cost of that but he's not prepared to pay it. Um, it seems to me airports rely on airlines, airlines rely on airports, um, a, a lot of investment I guess has to take place at Helsinki for your benefit in terms of a transfer product. What is your primary airport relationship like? Is it a good one? Is it a strong one there at uh, Helsinki Vanta Airport? Yeah. Um, we, of course, I mean, we have a little bit of same, same ownership, Finavia there mm -hmm. that runs the airport is fully owned by, by the government and, and, and government has taken on us. us so, so therefore there is, um, I would say, a bit more alignment uh, of, the, of the interests um, over there. But of course, we have the same cost concerns that, uh, that my colleagues uh, colleagues have uh, have and uh, and um, uh, many airlines. I mean, they don't have so much freedom to choose which which airports they they use, especially network carriers. Carriers. Uh, um, it's important for a network carrier to have a hub, and uh, and it's it's very costly to relocate a hub. So so therefore, it's a, it's a relationship where where it's uh, at times it's love and at, at times there's hate. Love and hate. <laughs> yes, absolutely. <laughs> And just to, let's look for a few moments at the broader context of the industry. Uh, you're somewhat geographically removed from the, the big discussion here about Brexit, but we've got Brexit going on. Uh, we've got a, a momentous day today in the USA with this particular election. This time tomorrow, we'll know where that is going to take us. Uh, how, what are your reflections on, on the challenges that the industry faces and, and, and for, what does that mean for Finnair in particular in the political uh, uh, governmental context around the world yeah of course i mean open open skies we, we hope that we will be able to continue with the development and and uh, uh, finner very much uh, sees that that all the skies should be open 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 in the world to 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 fly and and that's the direction we would like to continue to be uh, to be and and i'm sort of a i'm tr i trust that that will continue that that development, regardless of what kind of choices, political choices there will be, I know U.S. election tomorrow. We we all, when we wake up tomorrow, we we, we most likely we know what the result is. Yeah. Uh, result is at that moment, and um, uh, uh, America will continue to be attractive destination for many people to travel, uh, travel, and and likewise many Americans will continue to travel to Europe. Europe. So I don't think that. The, the election result will change too much of the of the fundamentals of, of this business. Um, companies in, in general, regardless of what business they are, they are the best ones to adapt. Countries may have difficulties, but companies can adapt there. 
the ways of operate. And I guess, again, coming from a different sector originally, you, you must have seen ups and downs in that industry. I don't really know what goes on in mining, but I guess mineral, world mineral prices and things like that change and demand levels, and you have to navigate that. That's, that's right. I mean, in, in that business, the commodity prices are the same, like have similar impact as, as for example, oil price on, on, on So do you feel, I mean, uh, I don't want to be crazy, but do you feel relatively comfortable? Comfortable is not really the right word, but you feel confident that Finnair can navigate this time, which is perhaps a, amongst the most challenging for airlines that we've seen for a long time. Um, yes, we have our, our strategy where we believe in that growth and accelerated growth is, is such an imp of, of such an importance for, for an airline like, like, like we are. I mean, I've used a few, few, times, uh, few times sort of uh, describe what the sort of cost cutting versus versus growth or focus on top line, what the relationship and priority should be. Because I mean, we did cut more than 200 million costs and it took us four years. And we thought that it was a pretty good execution of cost cutting program. Uh, but 200 million and four years, it makes about 50 million per year. Simple calculation. At the same time, we know that, uh, that, that the yields, ticket prices, RASC, whatever definition you, you use, they tend to come down 3 to 5% a year. That's, that's been the trend. Mm -hmm. uh, in our numbers, the 3 to 5% a year is, is, is between 50 million and 80 million a year. And if you only focus on cost cutting and you achieve 50 million, but your, your price, your top line is coming down 50 to 80 million a year, you know what the end result is. is you, you do a lot of work for nothing. So, so therefore, uh, the 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 equation needs to be that the top priority should be with the with the with the top line, and then the second priority, important one, needs to be in how to operate continuously, more efficiently. And they and need to go hand in hand. And maybe that point feeds into d uh, consideration of, of your product uh, and digital. I mean, to, you need to get those revenues, not any. Uh, maintain them, but as you say, counteract the, the fall in ticket prices. And I was reading, for example, in uh, non-ticket revenues, ancillaries, which more and more airlines are talking about, led by low cost, you're looking for almost a 50% a increase. Uh, so tell us a bit about the product experience and what, how that ties in with uh, generating new revenues uh, for the business. Yeah, we, we started about two years ago to talk about this top line, the importance of top line and and of course the ancillaries and unbundling that, that many airlines had done before us. Uh, so we, we went that path and, and I think it's been a good and healthy path for, uh, for, for, for us. Uh, uh, currently we're growing our, our ancillaries uh, when we look at the total, uh, total euros, we're growing them at about 30% per year. So you, you get sort of double, double growth impact on, on that one because we're growing, growing the, the, the passenger number but then we're also adding services, new services into, into it. And, uh, and uh, that's just the basics. Basically, we started from a fairly low level. I think we are reaching out now to some sort of average level of, of airlines. And, uh, and uh, I just recently saw some forecasts uh, where, where the ancillary services will go by 2025. And I think they will grow something like three or four times from where they are today. Today, the number was 40 billion for all airlines. US dollars and, and uh, it's supposed to be something like 130 million by 2025 and, and we aim to, aim to be in par, at least in par with, with that development. Of course, um, uh, customers are becoming more and more demanding. I mean, services, they need to be what, what, they, what customers really need and want and they need to be uh, easily available and easily uh, acquirable so that people can buy them simple in, in, the, in a simple way with a few few sort of a clicks uh, clicks from their mobile devices that's the expectation what is out there and, and of course those capabilities we are developing right now so you really are uh, thinking about what the customer wants in terms of these additional products and you're getting into the digital world which we're hearing more and more is the word for airlines so I read that you've appointed a chief digital officer to, to, to look into yes, this. that's right. We have a management management team position of, of CD, CDO, and uh, um, and uh, she has uh, sort of developed a strategy just recently for us in in that one, and, uh, and we do have a roadmap ahead of us uh, on those services that we. And do you think in your home market, maybe you also helped that there's uh, a Scandic, if you like. Uh, 
acceptance or, or um, wi wisdom about uh, all the electronic technology, be it mobile phones, obviously, you know, Finland being home of Nokia, even if it's not top of the heap anymore, mm -hmm. but uh, being early adopters of this technology, is that helping you that your customers in your home market at least are much more receptive than maybe some other airlines? Yes, yes, and, yes and no. I think there's a bit of a dilemma. dilemma. In, in European scale, maybe so, but then when we look at Asia, which is so important for us and for us and uh, and and they kind of went straight into mobile in in, in Asia and uh, and uh, we are and plus then they have different platforms I mean it's uh, we, we all know that that they have the the way and uh, and, uh, uh, and 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 the ones like uh, like that are that are different from from what we we use here in Europe Europe and Western world so uh, so there's something to catch up for us I think we know what we need to do but we need to now deliver deliver and uh, and uh, to 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 make for example or our ancillary services available uh, to to group passengers in china uh, it takes much more than just to have your own 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 mobile application for for that one okay pecky we're nearly out of time amazingly but let's just see if anybody would like to ask a question directly to you from the audience anybody have a question for pecker i think it's been a fascinating story so far no questions yeah, gentleman on the front. We'll just get a mic to you. If we could just uh, grab a mic quick down to the gentleman at the front. If you're just going to introduce yourself uh, as you ask your question, the mic is almost with you. Hi, hello. I'm Tom Otley from Business Traveller magazine. I was wondering if you just talk about the, the issues with the A350 and, and having to at least, I believe, uh, an A340 and the, the cancellation or suspension of Chongqing because of that. Yeah, um, uh, yeah the Chongqing flight... Um, uh, flight we ended up cancelling. We all also cancelled one frequency from from Nagoya at the same time. Same time was re really to create enough uh, time for our pilots for training. Training it was nothing had nothing to do with the A350 technical issues. It was just a training issue. Any more questions for Pekka? Yeah, mic down the front again, please. Uh, Victoria Moores with Air Transport World. You mentioned the importance of the joint ventures and that they make up 20 to 25 percent of your business. I wondered whether you were looking at constructing any similar agreements to the ones that you already have, whether there's any areas where you feel as though that could boost the business or whether the transatlantic and Asian needs that you've got it covered. Thank you. Um, we are currently not in any, any additional sort of discussions with uh, with with that one, but but of course, I mean, we have to look at look at the globe and the opportunities, and there might be in, in future some some possibilities as as well. But I think uh, these two joint businesses they they cover cover important part of our business, and and already 25 percent of our our revenues in in these joint businesses. I think it's a, it's a it's a fair fair amount of of revenues there. Any more for any more? No. Just I want to ask you a couple of closing comments, Pekka, about, about uh, uh, tourism and governments and regulation. I mean, you already mentioned about you know, Chinese, for example, enjoying to try uh, Finnish culture and get up to uh, Finnish uh, Lapland. Uh, is your contribution to, to specifically Finnish tourism and maybe more broadly European tourism uh, you know, high in your thinking, and do you have uh, uh, very significant relationships there with, say, your, your tourist board or tourism ministries? Uh, either in Finland or other parts of Europe uh, to help develop that? Yeah. Uh, of course, I mean, airline like, like Finnair, and especially because so many people are traveling via Helsinki, Helsinki, many of them staying in Helsinki, and we've uh, just um, uh, recently, together with Visit Finland, um, introduced a stopover product where we uh, allow f our passengers to, to to stop without extra costs uh, the the flight trip in in Helsinki and and then take take program from from a great variety of uh, of uh, of options uh, uh, and spend some time in in Finland and and we do play a central role uh, similar uh, travel fair in 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 Finland not quite sure whether it's a similar much smaller though but though but uh, when we were doing the cost cuttings a few years back we did not participate in it and. And uh, I just spoke last night with one of the organizers of that one, and they said that they're so happy that Finnair is back. It's like it's like the the heart and soul of it was kind of missing, taken <laughs> away. <laughs> yeah, taken away. 
Well, it's, it's interesting as well because uh, uh, you do this stopover package, uh, uh, part of a runway debate here. Uh, some, uh, some people with a particular view would say, well, these transfer passengers we have through Heathrow uh, don't add anything to the British economy, but you're demonstrating transfer passengers and adding something locally to a country's economy can be compatible, but you have to go out and look for it and develop yeah. it. Well, uh, aviation as such contributes to Finnish economy uh, quite a bit. Um, Oxford economists have made a study a couple of years back and it's about 4% of the GDP come from the aviation. And transfer traffic is, is, is part of that. That plus we have to remember that we carry a whole lot of cargo in the belly of our, our, our passenger planes and, and that, that volume is, is increasing uh, altogether. It, Finnair employs only just over 5,000 people now. Uh, but the, the, the entire cluster where, where Finnair is in the, in, the, in the center of it employs about 120,000 people. So I'm sure it contributes to, to the economy. Massively. And transfer traffic is important part of it. Without transfer traffic, without Asian leg, Finnair would be probably one third of its size. Excellent. And lastly, on, on governments. Uh, governments and airlines are not always good bedfellows. You've described very positive uh, aspects of your relationship and of course with the government as your shareholder but uh, we talked about airport costs uh, we heard yesterday from some of our speakers about countries putting taxes on flight tickets and you've just joined a, a new airline uh, industry lobby body here A4E airlines for Europe what, what is your broad view about governments and their attitude to airlines not just the Finnish government I mean any government on the network that you serve have they got the, the right approach or have they got a lot to learn and to change um, yeah uh, yes and no <laughs> there, there are issues issues clearly I mean of course I mean airlines um, need to look into into mirror what kind of service they have provided to customers over, over the years Yes, many airlines have gone through cost-cutting programs and things, things like that. But, but then, on the other hand, uh, airlines have been put a lot of uh, responsibility as well. For example, all the consumer rights, uh, rights things like, for example, airlines are compensating much more to, to, to passengers than what they have paid for their, for their travel. And, and I think that's, that's quite a unique, unique and uh, not a positive thing, thing as a such. And it, it becomes a heavy burden for for, for airlines and 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 uh, uh, kind of a it's, it's a bit of a surprising to see that this happens and and happens happens in an industry which which really hasn't been very profitable. So there's probably a, a need for this new group that you've joined A4E to really get out there and do some education, lobbying and uh, influencing. That's right, and that's why I welcome this uh, A4E, A4E e approach. That uh, fewer issues, but let's put all our effort, emphasis, and force behind it. Great. Pekka, that's a good point to stop. Uh, thank you very much for coming today and, and talking to us. Uh, a pleasure to meet you. Uh, Pekka Varamo, CEO of Finnair. Thank you, John. Now, if any here in London tomorrow, uh, Pekka is speaking at the UK Aviation Club, so come and hear more tomorrow on what uh, Finnair is uh, doing in the next few years. We wish you a good remaining stay in London and hopefully see you next time. See you, ladies and gentlemen, next year for the uh, World, Travel, World Travel Markets Aviation Programme. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Pekka. Thank Cheers. Thank you.